Any finish worthy is only as worthy as the surface that you put it on. Uh, most people think they sand something out nice. Uh, the majority of the times you look at it, if you put it in a bright light, especially a halogen light, you'll see all kinds of little scratch marks. 90% of them are going in a circle. Uh, I'll explain how I do that to get away from it. Uh, sanding, again, like I said, I think most people go at it a little wrong. Uh, I cut a bowl as clean as I can, and I believe I can probably compare with most of the guys in the room for a uh, clean surface. That doesn't mean that I don't start with 100 grit. And if necessary, I start with heavier than that. Okay, another thing that everybody grabs uh, the soft discs. I use them, but not initially. My initial grit or sanding pad is one of the old power locks. In other words, they, they come apart. They were some of the first ones that were ever out there. That and the glue-on ones. The glue-on ones, uh, they would heat up and just fly off. So that was before Velcro. There was two things that really were against this power lock. When the lathe started getting reverses on them, or the drill started getting reversed. If you run it reverse, it comes off. So you only want to run it in one direction, and that's forward. Okay. The other thing that people were doing, this is pretty stiff. And people were bending that, and they still do, and put grooves in the bowl with that edge. Uh, I don't care which type you're using, you don't want to use the head, you want to use the face as much as you possibly can. Um, I believe that this, with say a hundred grit, will take most of your ripples or anything out, and it has a tendency of bridging over anything that's low. Everybody understand what I'm saying there? You know, if, if you have uh, a little step, you'll actually get the high spot on the step. That fly didn't like to be there. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you can you can knock those surfaces out and take in, and get a good smooth surface. It's not going to be scratch free by no means. Take a real good look at that surface right then and there. If there's anything in there that shouldn't be, continue with that heavy grit. If you continue with the next grit and the next grit, you really don't get that mark out until you've highlighted everything around it. And I think a lot of people over sand a bowl or anything. On a bowl, any face grain that's showing eats up much faster than the end grain, so you can get hollows in there. So you want to keep that as flat as you can and go through and get a nice finish. When you got that, where all your imperfections are out to the 100 grit, then move on to the next, maybe 120. Continue as you are. If there's fine stuff in there, uh, you may have to go back to the 100. I'm not against going back to the 100. Has anybody ever sanded elm? Yes. I mean, it's, it, it can be like a washboard because the summer grain is so much softer than the winter grain that you eat that soft stuff up real fast. Well, this would kind of bridge over that type of a situation. But on the other hand, if you've got a big circle in the bottom of the bowl that is face grain, that'll eat it up too. 
So you have to be kind of careful and use your common sense. Just don't hog it in one place, kind of keep it moving. Then there are times when that big one just doesn't get in the right spot. And these are a smaller one, two inch ones. I think they even make them one and a half or one inch. And I don't even bother with that. Now one of the things that I do this little handle nothing rotates this one or this one I can take it out I can put it in my drill and use it like a regular one but sometimes you get to the point you don't want it to turn so I will just hold this and just do this or lightly turn it as I go so I don't cut any grooves. Um, found that at a garage sale, put a handle on it, it works like a charm. Um, I've got a drill chuck on this one so that you can take it apart. And if you don't, you probably aren't going to be able to hold the shaft and, and put it on and off. One of the other ones that I like, I don't use it a whole lot, but again, that's the Australian power one. It'll actually, depending on which side you hold it, it's the rotation direction that it goes. And uh, what I like about it, I can hold it and slow it down and make it cut a little better than if you allow it just to spin. Also, you can stand there and sand with it, you got a handle on it. So it's, uh, it's good in that respect. Another one that I use, again, both of these I don't use a whole lot, but there are times when you get into a situation and you just can't quite get there. So I will take and uh, change the angle that I need this to, and basically it's the same as the other one. Just go ahead and uh, do whatever you need to. Now, when I get sanding with the power locks, it's a rarity if I go past 150. Uh, I don't feel that they, that they work as good as a, a soft one past that grip. I have done it. I, I've got finer ones at home. Uh, about the time I tell you I don't do it, tomorrow I will. So, I mean, everything I'm telling you changes for the type of wood, uh, maybe the shape of the bowl, your mood for the day, whatever. The only thing I'm telling you is just to keep it smooth, keep it as flat as you can, and make sure you get all the imperfections out. Once I get to 150, then I take it, I'll grab the soft ones with the velcro, and I'll work my way up. Normally, Oh, maybe 320, sometimes 400, but normally not. I don't think you can get all the scratches out with the lathe running or with these. You can take paper and sand a bowl that's out all the way, and you won't see it for a while, but in a week or two, you can see where the paper has actually left marks in the uh, in the surface. I'm sure you've all seen these before. When I get down to whatever, like maybe 400 or so, I normally take and start with sandpaper. Uh, this is thin cat. The only place I've ever seen it is craft supply. And I'm really not promoting them, it's just they're the only ones I've ever seen that have it. It's, uh, I used to sand up to 500 and quit. 400 and quit because I had 500 and it wouldn't sand. Well, this goes to 600 and it still throws dust but not scratches which I'm really happy about. 
Anyway, I take a sheet and I cut it into six and I fold it into thirds. Okay, that does a couple things for me. Number one, it pads it. It's a little thicker than, than uh, just a plain paper. Uh, it gives you a few extra edges to sand up the shoulders or whatever you need. Plus, when you get that all gummed up, just open it up and you have another clean sheet underneath. What I have here is 180, 220, 320, 400, and 600. When I work my piece, I just hold them in my hand and I'll sand. The next one goes underneath, and when I'm done, they're still in order until I drop them. And yes, that happens. <coughs> When I get to normally about 400, I don't sand with the blade running anymore. Well, to a point. I'll take my, say, 400 paper, and I'll take it, just give a over the bowl once in an hour, shut it off. If you take a look, you'll see scratches that you couldn't see when it was turning. So I will hold that bowl steady. I have it on the lathe, and I'll just sand that by hand. And when I think I've got it all clean, I'll go to the next grip, turn the lathe on and just puff it, and it'll burnish that surface, and you'll say, how did I miss those scratches? And I'll go in and sand them, especially on the end grain. Face grain sands up and cleans up real good, but it's always the end grain that, that kills you that really gives you the pain in the butt. And I'll continue that until I've got uh, my, my surface sanded like I want. One of the things that I've done of late that I hadn't done before, I bought a halogen light, one of the magnetic ones, and I put a strip of metal on the rafter over the blade, and it hangs down so it's not in my way. But that halogen light will show up scratches and stuff that uh, the incandescent won't. I don't like to turn with it. Uh, it gives an odd light. I'd rather turn with my incandescent. So I just turn it off. But when it comes to the sanding or something that I really have to look at close, then I kind of like that halogen. Uh, when I get down, There's some other papers that occasionally I use. Arbonet, I don't know if you folks are familiar with that. It's got its place. I don't think it's a cure-all. But uh, there are times when I think it's really good, and other times I don't even bother with it. Uh, again, one piece of wood is going to act differently than when it comes down to the nitty gritty, I have some stuff here, it's a foam back paper. I have it in 1,000, 1,200, and 1,500. Uh, it's fine. Uh, occasionally I'll use it on the bowl before I take it put finish on it, but normally by the time I get through the 600 for whatever I'm using, it's normally in pretty good shape. What I do with this stuff is I sand after I have taken and put finish on it and allowed it to dry. This guy, you'll be seeing him at the symposium. Vince is Wood Wonders. Uh, he handles it. I think he's got it like 400 on up. I think my other sandpaper competes with it, maybe even beats it. Uh, on the higher grips, there's not a whole lot. I like the foam on it because it pads it. <coughs> okay, once, once we got everything straightened out, and we're ready for finish. Anything else? You are 
in between where to go and why you stop on the drive and go back? What was that? Do you ever wet the water? Uh, only when I'm cutting. Uh, sanding, I, I normally don't. Uh, what he's referring to is if you've got a, a, a bad spot and nine times out of ten it ends up on the end grain. Uh, if I'm going to be using oil, sometimes I'll take oil and put it on that spot. And it kind of acts like a shaving cream. Of course, there's a couple of you in here that won't understand that. <laughs> But uh, I think what it does, it softens it and kind of holds it and it allows you to take a, a cleaner cut than you could just on the dry end of itself. Uh, some people, I do believe, take it sand with water. I don't initially. Uh, I sometimes think it stands the green up, which it, I know it does, but I would rather not have it stand up at that point. And when I get going, I'll explain that again. <clears throat> My bowl is on the lathe. Sand it out, ready to finish.
Do you want to do the other side right away? Which balloon finish do you do? Beg your pardon? Which balloon finish? Our third person. Yeah, there's two of them. Good thing you mentioned that to me, Don. Uh, there's one with wax in it. I do not use that. I feel wax is, that, that balloon with the wax in it is meant to be the final coat. And uh, I learned a long time ago when I was doing art shows, wax is not good in art shows. If it rains and you get a drop of water on it, you got a white spot. I found that if I just used the oil, all I had to do was hit with oil again and it was all back to where, where it started. If I'm correct, that's uh, oil and poly. It's what? Oil and poly, I think is the blend. Oh, I've heard it said. Uh, it's just secret formula. You know, uh, how they say everybody's got their little bitty thing that is supposed to, supposed to create miracles. There is no miracle in finishing, as far as I'm concerned. Now, I would, would just keep this wet for a little bit and make sure that it's not soaking in anywhere. If it's soaking in somewhere, keep at it. But I doubt this piece of maple is soaking up anything here. I don't see anything. It becomes dull looking. Okay. Everything's shiny, and all of a sudden you'll have this patch of dull stuff where it's soaked in and it does, it's lost its sheen. So I've, I've had some pieces that were relatively thin where I would see it soaking in on this side and turn around and look, and it's starting to come out the other side. That's not the best of old wood, but it. It was pretty. It's a 
I think it's the best that I've had. Now I will leave that set, and tomorrow I'll come back to it. And chances are, when you run your hand in there, it feels smooth, but if you really pay attention, you're going to see it feel little, little tiny pimples. Now, the oil will take and, and kind of rise up and dry and leave you spots on there. Pertaining to how, how much of that stuff you've got, sometimes I'll just take the steel wool and a little more oil and go over it. I don't use depth at this point, period, anymore. I just use it for the initial coat. So I'll just take and scrub that and see how good it comes. And then take and oil it again, wipe it dry, and leave it set. Uh, where's that other bowl at? Did it make it around yet? Or? I guess I can pass this around. It's not really oily. Okay, this bowl has had a, a couple coats on it, and I'll take either a thousand or twelve hundred, like I passed around, and I'll sand it out. When you first sand it, you're going to scream at yourself, why did I bother to do this? Because it's going to leave a lot of scratches in there. So, you don't want to be real brutal with the sandpaper. I mean, don't think that just by pushing on it heavy, it's going to help you, it's not. Be gentle with your sanding with that paper. Pretty soon, everything's going to start coming out. Uh, like, I don't know if you my walnut bowl over there. Now that's got a lot of voids in it or green, which is a little heavy. So you sand and you don't sand in those green patterns. You're sanding on top, so it kind of knocks the top off and kind of lets the extra oil in the bottom, so it looks like it's, you know, building a finish a little better. When you got that, again, put it in light, and sit down and take your time and just sand it out. Don't always sand with the round of the bowl, sand with the grain. Uh, when I said before, a lot of the sanding marks you'll see are all circular. Uh, that's why I don't finish sanding on the lathe with the lathe run. I strictly sand it by hand. I sand it in, basically, if I can, in the direction of the grain. If I can, I'll randomly sand it anyway, any way you can, just as long as you keep everything smooth and clean. Once I've reached that point, I get some shotgun patches. I bought a bunch of them. They're, they're nice smooth cloth and uh, nice size. As you can see, I don't have much oil in there at all. 
Same oil. Same oil. Same oil. So I will take and just rub that in. Okay, now it's started to get to where I, I'm not moving any oil. So I'll put just another drop or two on there. Could you soak the pad and then put it up? I don't have that much on there, Nick. Uh, that's, that's the thing. I think what it does, when you're doing this, there's not that much oil on there and it's drying. So if you've got some pores in there, that's going into the pores. And all you're doing is putting a, a hand rub finish on the bowl. I think that's one of the, the things that really matters is that you don't get too heavy of a coat on there that you're working because you're as you're sink or rubbing it in, you're actually drying it and just making it deep. Now the bottom here I put too much oil on there. It's not moving like it, it should. Of course that's easy enough, you just stand there and rub it a little while longer. Dry, and as it's drying, you're getting rid of the excess. But I'll just take it off for you. So, Kit, after that first coat dries and you're sanding it, you're sanding it with, are you using a steel wool to sand it, or are you uh, going back to... Normally, the first time I go over it, I use a steel wool. Okay. And then, after that, um, I'll take it just, maybe just oil it, it all depends how it feels. If I can feel anything on there, then I use something to remove that. Like a thousand grit sandpaper? Yeah, like the stuff I passed around. I really like that stuff. It's not, it's not meant to sand everything out. It's, it's meant to enhance the coat, I feel. Now naturally, that's probably gonna get some fingerprints on it, but at least you can see what it's done. Uh, there's a rule of thumb that the gun makers, gun stock makers use, and it would pertain to this very good. Coat once a day for a week. Coat once a week for a month. Coat once a month for a year. And then once a year after that. And that's what basically the gun stock makers go by, or what they used to. I'm sure they've got stuff today that's totally different than what we have. Uh, however much you want to build up on there, that's up to you after that point. I, I personally, I don't like a real, real high sheen. If I did, I would take and use lacquer. I'd like to let a little bit of the, the grain in the bowl show. You know, let, let them know that it's a piece of wood. Uh, we don't need a piece of plastic as far as I'm concerned. Anybody got any questions? If you were to guess, what would you guess that four ounce steel wool grit might be like? Uh, like an 800 or a 600? Or? I would say it's probably four to six in that range. Now, I bought all different kinds of steel wool. Liberon, which I, is supposed to be one of the top, and I hate this stuff because it comes apart. You'll end up with little pieces all over. Uh, this A stuff, for some reason, it doesn't come apart. It hangs together. So that is, that is the reason that I use that. But uh, I don't go with the heavier steel wool, you know, like the pot or double lock, and I like the four off. Yes, Mark? Um, we 
What's that? The first code that you find says that. Is it that lacquer? It's a brushing lacquer. see why you couldn't use any of the oils that you want. Uh, that's what you're asking, right? Okay. Uh, I have used uh, Mahoney's walnut oil. I really don't care for that. I've used death oil. I used to use that before Maloof, and then I couldn't get it anymore. But that was a nice oil. Uh, Water locks. That's another nice one that they use. The only one that I, I refuse to use is Watco. Uh, I've used Watco and I come back and wipe everything as clean as I can. Come back in 15 minutes and around every pore there's a little halo where it has raised up. So I gotta wipe it again. Maybe it's just me, but uh, I, I've done that so many times with Watco, so I just don't even bother using it. Uh, I do like the way that the Maloof oil kind of dries in a hurry, in a sense. Uh, you can keep it wet easy, but I mean, when you get it down thin, it dries out and you can work it in by hand. Loves of yes. Any which? Okay, I, I I have used them, but I really don't. I've got it at home, and I'll be honest with you, I don't use it. Every time I go to do something, I grab what I normally do. Um, I guess I, I do a lot of barbecuing and smoking, and I. Got all different kinds of seasonings, and five times out of ten, I'll reach for the old ones that I do all the time anyway, instead of experimenting with the new ones. So I'm I'm a poor one to give you at least, you know, uh, my opinion on that. Ace. Ace hardware. What about it? Mineral oil is a cleaner. That's a dissolve. It will dissolve things. You don't want to use that for that. The weirdest one I ever heard one time when I was at a symposium when a guy was talking. I used motor oil. I can't imagine that. Uh, the only other finish that I use, if I have a bowl that I know is going to be used for food, I take and use mineral oil. Is that the mineral? Oh, okay, I, I'm thinking. Oh, okay. I'm thinking mineral spirits. My mistake. Oh, yeah. My mistake. Yes, I use mineral oil. Uh, I know that won't hurt you because I used to get a tablespoon once a week, whether I needed it or not. <laughs> oh, you remember those days, huh? Because <laughs> you were a fat boy. <laughs> but now, is is Maloof oil safe? Yes. Is lacquer safe for food? Yes. Once all the dryers have evaporated. When that has happened, there's nothing in this stuff that's going to hurt you. It's the dryers that they can and make it bad. I read quite a few articles on that, and, and I have yet to come across one that says that it's not okay, or that it's okay once the, the dryers have evaporated. Yes. Have you ever used any sanding fillers? No, I really don't. Um, I just, I just don't. You mentioned initially your problem did you create a slurry? Mm -hmm. Does that slurry act like a filler? Then? I would say so to a point. Yes. You know, I mean, if if you've got eight-inch holes, someone ain't going to help it a whole lot. But if you've got small um, green marks in that. I, I feel it fills that in pretty fast, or it helps you. 
Yes. Yeah, you only put on one coat of death. That's the only time I use the is the initial coat. But again, when I put that on, I do not allow it to dry. And I take it off with the steel wool and the oil. And I'm sure that it takes it, that steel wool and the oil has to take it off the surface. You know, so if the slurry that it makes, it goes into the pores, helps you build a finish, but other than that, once I'm done with that, I don't I don't use the depth anymore at all. Right. Yes, Peter. Um, there is no formula. Uh, I put on until I'm happy with it. Uh, the little bowl, when it comes around, that probably, no, that one's only probably got maybe three coats on it. Uh, the little one, that's got a lot more, but I, I brought that in to show you. Uh, it had a pretty open grain to it. So, I don't know, I just, I just put the coats on until I'm happy with it. And uh, what, what's going to happen sooner or later, that last final coat, you're going to leave fingerprints in it, and then you're going to have to do that over again. So, I mean, there's, there's a coat you don't think about that you do. What about the direction that you use for your this? Just a brush in a jar. Is it a special brush or? Um, it was, but I can't, I can't buy it anymore. Just a, a jar that uh, is inlaid into the top of the cap. And if, you, if you're egotistical, you got to take and put some inlays in it. And the, the brush actually goes up into the handle just to short the little bit. Is that a uh, synthetic brush or a natural? Uh, it was ones that I ordered from Sears. Uh, and uh, I couldn't get them anymore. I even, even emailed a company in China that made them, but they quit making them. And I found a guy that imported them. And he said, they, they don't make them anymore. I said, what am I going to use? So they gave me another style. It's close, but it's not as nice as that brush is. So. You know what that brush is? Is it some type of a mohair? Or like I think it's a poly of some kind. I I can tell you at home, I got But it's a... Badger, badger. No, it's not badger. No, it's a, I'm sure it's a poly type versus. Did you ever try Glicks to see if they look at something? Yes. Uh, I, I, I actually talked to the guy that imports all the brushes down in Florida. And he gave me one and it's a purdy brush out of uh, Minnesota. It's a little bigger than this, it's dark bristles, but it still works basically the same. Anybody else got a question? You ever use the three inch disc on two inch pad in a robot lock? No. I'm sure it'd work, but I mean, it, to me, it's de de defeating its purpose. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I use the whip ring tool. Yeah, before you put any finish. Well, it doesn't. Uh, I, I put it on the, the raw bowl before I did it when I brought it here. Normally, I finish it, get it close, and then I take it whenever I feel I got a couple of them. Normally, I sign a few of them at a time. Once I sign them, I'll take steel wool and go back over it. Either that or some really, really fine, like thousand paper. And then give it another coat, you can't tell it it's been done. So you sharpen the tip of that pen? Yes, I did. I sharpened my tip uh, pretty much to a, a pretty decent point, and uh, I rarely get it hot enough to where it turns red. 
because it's not that thick. Now, it's been good for me for probably 10 or 12 years, and I've never burned that tip up for one reason. I have a new one in the drawer. <laughs> if, if I didn't have that tip, I'd have burned it out know how many times. <laughs> you also have a short name. Yes, but I sign it a lot. <laughs> yes. Do you ever use anything like pumice or rough stone for smoothing the finish at all? The only time that I ever used uh, rotten stone was 1966. <laughs> uh, I had uh, just bought a lathe the year before, and I was making candlesticks for my mother and my mother-in-law. And I was using cherry, and I was reading in the books how they did a French polish. And it was a shellac, a little alcohol, and rotten stone, and you just kept buffing that out there. And uh, I don't know, I'm sure there's a couple of you guys here, probably uh, two years ago I brought in a set of candlesticks, and somebody asked me when I made those, you know, when did I start doing this again? And I flip it over and it said 1966 Christmas. <laughs> and they still have a nice finish on Anybody else? Yes? When you sign it, do you date it all or just do a... The only time I ever date it um, is for a particular purpose. I just signed a bowl for the TOC and I did date it in TOC. But uh, nine times out of ten, I do not date it. Like I say, unless it's for maybe a gift for a wedding or something like that, then I will date it or if people ask me to. But when I was doing the art shows, if you had a bowl that was two years old and somebody picked it up and looked at it, oh, I want this, nobody else wanted it, you know. <laughs> and evidently it goes bad after two years. <laughs> of course, you, you can't figure people out all the time. So, but, so I just never dated unless I have a reason for doing so. I guess that's it then.